Chapter 5 We walked along the corridor which separated room from room outside the main chamber, and soon we came to the medical health room. In we went, and on came the lights as bright as before. The place looked untouched. There was no sign that we had been there previously, no sign that our dust-covered feet had left tracks. It looked as if the floor had been newly polished, and the metal fittings around the central pool newly burnished. We observed that just in passing, and it stirred in my mind a thought of more questions. But first of all, Master, will you put your legs in the pool now, and then I will take off these bandages? The lama swung his legs into the pool and sat on the tiled edge. I got in, and unwound the bandages. As I got down near the flesh I felt sick, sick. The bandages here were yellow and thoroughly beastly looking. Whatever is the matter with you, Lobsang? You look as if you have had too much strange food to eat. Oh, master, your legs are so bad, I think we shall have to try to get monks come and carry you back to the Chakpuri, I said. Lobsang, things are not always what they seem. Take off all the bandage, take off all the wrappings, do it with your eyes shut if you like, or perhaps I should do it myself. I got to the end of the bandage, and I found that I should not be able to take that off, because it was stuck in a perfectly horrible, gooey, scabulous mess from which I recoiled. But the lama reached down for the bundle of bandage, and gave it quite a tug, and the end came away with syrupy strings of something dangling from it. Without turning a hair, he just tossed the bandages down on the flooring, and said, "'Well, now, I am going to press this valve, and then the pool will fill. I had it turned off before, because obviously we didn't want you undoing bandages when you are up to your waist in water. You get out of the pool, and I will turn the water on faster.' I hastily clambered out, and took a look at those horrid legs. If we had been in Chakpuri, or somewhere like that, I think both of them would have been amputated, and what a thing that would be for the Lama Mingyar Dondup always travelling around to do good for someone. But as I looked, slabs of stuff fell off his legs, slabs of bilious yellow and green material fell off his legs and floated on the surface of the pool. The lama hitched himself a bit higher out of the water, and then turned the valve on more so the water level rose, and the floating material floated out through what I suppose was an overflow device. He looked at the book again, and then made certain adjustments to a bunch of, well, I can only call them valves. They were different coloured valves, and I saw the water changing colour, and there was a very medicinal odour on the air. I looked at his legs again, and now they were showing pink, pink, like a newborn baby, and then he hoisted his robe a bit higher, and went a bit further down the sloping bottom, so that the healing water went halfway up his thighs. There he stood. Sometimes he would stand still, sometimes he would walk slowly around, but all the time the legs were healing. They went from an angry pink to a healthy pink, and at last there was no trace of the yellow scab, no trace at all. It had gone completely, and I looked up from his legs to take a look at the bandages I had taken off. I felt my scalp tingle. The bandages had gone, no trace of them, not a mark. They had just gone, and I was so shocked and astonished that, involuntarily, I sat down, forgetting I was in the water, medicated water at that. When sitting down in the lotus position, well, if one is doing it in water, one should keep one's mouth shut. The taste was horrible. And yet it wasn't. It was pleasant. I found that a tooth which had been giving some trouble since I fell some time before ceased to trouble me. I could feel it in my mouth. I stood up quickly and spat over the edge of the pool. Yes, there was the tooth. It was cracked in half. Now it lay there in front of me. And I said to myself, There! Blast you! Now you go and ache as much as you like. As I looked at the tooth, I saw an absolutely weird sight. The tooth was moving, moving towards the nearest wall, and as it touched the wall it disappeared. There I stood like a fool, dripping with water from my shaven scalp to my bare feet, trying to look at something that wasn't there. 
I turned around to ask the Lama Minyar Dondup if he had seen it, and he was standing over a certain place on the floor where the tiling was of different colour, and warm, healing air was coming out of the floor, and he was soon dry. "'Your turn, Lobsang,' said the Lama. "'You look like a half-drowned fish, so you'd better come over here and get yourself dry.' Truth to tell, I did feel like a half-drowned fish, and then I thought, well, how can a fish be half-drowned when it lives in water? So I asked the Lama how it could be, and his reply was, yes, it is perfectly true, one can take a fish from the water, and its gills start to dry immediately. If you put it back in the water, it will actually drown. We do not know the mechanism of it, but we know it to be a fact. But you look a lot better now that you have been on the healing pad. You were looking worn out before, and now you look as if you could run a hundred miles. I went across and looked at his legs at closer quarters, and even as I looked the pinkness started to disappear, and his legs soon returned to their ordinary natural colour, and there was no trace at all that only an hour before the flesh had been almost stripped from his bones. Here were his legs, healthy, fresh-looking, and I had been thinking how they would be amputated. Master, I said, there are so many questions that I am almost ashamed to ask you for the answers, but I cannot understand how food and drink which has been here for endless years can still be quite fresh and quite potable. Even in our ice refrigerator meat gradually goes bad, so how can it be that this place, millions of years of age, can be as new as though it were built only yesterday? We live in a peculiar age, Lobsang, an age where no man trusts another man. Some time ago people in a white country absolutely refused to believe that there were black people and yellow people. It was just too fantastic to be believed. And then some people travelling to another country saw men on horseback. Now they had never seen horses before. They did not know there was such a thing as a horse, so they fled and when they went back to their own country they said they had seen a man-horse, a centaur. But even when it was known that horses were animals, which could be ridden by men, still many people disbelieved it, and they thought that the horse was a special sort of human, changed into an animal's form. There are so many things like that. People will not believe that anything new can be, unless they themselves have actually seen it, touched it, and pulled it to pieces. Here we are reaping the fruits of a very, very high civilization indeed, not one of the Atlantises, because, as I told you, Atlantis is only the word for the disappearing land. No, these places go back far, far beyond Atlantis, and there is an automatic means of stopping all development, all growth, until a human comes within a certain range. So if no human came here again, this place would remain just as it is now, impregnable and without any signs of corruption or dissolution. But if people come and use the place as we have done, then after a number of such users the place would deteriorate, it would age. Fortunately we are in one which has been very, very rarely used. In fact, it has been used only twice since it was made. Master, how can you possibly tell that only twice has this place been used? The Lama pointed up to something dangling from the ceiling. There, he said, if anyone passes beyond that it shows in figures, and this one shows the figure three. The last one is you and me. When we leave, and it won't be for three or four days, the time of our stay will be recorded, ready for the next people to enter and to speculate upon who was here before them. But you know, Lobsang, I am trying to get you to realise that the degree of civilization when this place was built was the highest which has ever been attained on this world. You see, first of all, they were the guardians of the world, the gardeners of the world. Their civilization was such that they could melt rock, even the hardest rock, and leave it with a glass-like finish and the melting would be what we term a cold melt, that is, no heat would be generated, so a place could be used immediately. But I really cannot understand why these so highly civilised people should want to live inside mountain ranges, 
You told me that this mountain range extends all the way across the world, and so why should they hide themselves? I asked. The best thing we can do is to go to the room of the past, the present, and the future. This is the store of knowledge of all that has happened in the world. The history you have learnt in classes is not always true. It has been altered in its recording to suit the king or dictator in power at the time. Some of these people want to be known as their reign being of the Golden Age, but seeing the actual thing, the actual Akashic record, well, then one can't go wrong. Did you say the Akashic record, Master? I thought that we could only see that when we were in the astral plane. I did not know that we could come to the mountains and see all that had happened, I said. Oh, yes, you forget that things can be copied. We have reached a certain stage of civilization. We think we are shockingly clever, and we wonder if anyone will ever be cleverer. But come along with me, and I will show you the actual truth. Come along, it is quite a little walk, but the exercise will do you good. Master, isn't there some way that I can avoid you walking? Isn't there something like a sled, or could I pull you if you were sitting on a stout piece of cloth? No, no, thank you, Lopsang. I am quite capable of walking the distance. In fact, that exercise may be good for me as well. So let us set out. We did set out, and I should have liked to investigate some of the interesting things. I was vastly intrigued with the doors, each with an inscription engraved on the door itself. All these rooms, Lobsang, are devoted to different sciences, sciences which have never yet been heard of on this world, because here we are like blind people trying to find the way in a house with many corridors, but I am as a sighted person because I can read these inscriptions, and, as I told you, I have had experience of these caves before. At last we came to an apparently blank wall. There was a door to the left and a door to the right, but the Lama Mingyar Dondup ignored them, and instead he stood right in front of that blank wall, and uttered a most peculiar sound in an authoritative tone. Immediately, without a sound, the blank space split down the middle, and the two halves disappeared into the sides of the corridor. Inside there was just a faint light showing, a glimmering as of starlight. We went into the room, and it seemed as large as the world. With a very slight sigh, the two halves of the door slid across the corridor, and this time we were at the opposite side of the apparently blank wall. The light brightened somewhat, so that we could dimly see a great globe floating in space. It was more pear-shaped than round, and there were flashes from both ends of the globe. These flashes are the magnetic fields of the world. You will learn all about that a bit later. I stood with mouth agape. There seemed to be shimmering curtains of ever-changing light around the poles. They seemed to undulate and flow from one end to the other but with a very great weakening of colours round about the equator. The Lama said some words, words in a language unknown to me. Immediately there came the light of faint dawn, like the light which comes at the birth of a new day, and I felt like one who had just sat up now, awakened from a dream. But it was no dream, as I soon found. The Master said, We will sit over here, because this is a console, with which the ages of the world can be varied. You are not in the third dimension now, remember. Here you are in the fourth dimension, and few people can live through that. So if you feel in any way upset or ill, then tell me quickly, and I can put you right. I could dimly see the Lama's right hand reach out and ready to turn a button. Then he turned to me again and said, Are you sure you feel all right, Lobsang? No feeling of nausea, no feeling of sickness. No, sir, I feel just fine and absolutely fascinated, and I am wondering what we shall see first. Well, first of all we have to see the formation of the world, and then the arrival of the gardeners of the world. They will come and look around, survey the place and all that, and then they will go away to plan, and later still you will see them arrive in a huge spaceship, because that is really what the moon is. Suddenly all was dark, the darkest darkness that I had ever experienced. 
even on a moonless night there had been dim starlight, and even in a closed room with no windows there was still an impression of a little light, but here there was nothingness, not a thing. And then I nearly jumped off my feet, I nearly jumped out of my robe with fright. With incredible speed two faint dots of light were coming together, and they hit, they collided, and then the screen was filled with light. I could see swirling gases and smokes of different colours, and then the whole screen, the whole globe, filled everything. I could see rivers of fire running down from flame-belching volcanoes. The atmosphere was almost turgid. I was aware, but dimly, that I was watching something, and that I wasn't actually there in person. So I watched and was more and more fascinated as the world shrank a little and the volcanoes became less, but the seas were still smoking with the hot lava which had poured in. There was nothing except rocks and water. There was only one stretch of land, not a very large stretch of land, but just one solid lump, and it gave to the globe a peculiar erratic motion. It did not follow a circular path, but seemed to be following a path which some shaky child had drawn. Gradually, as I watched, the world became rounder and cooler. Still there was nothing but rock and water, and terrible storms which raged across the surface. The wind pushed up the tops of the mountains, and those tops fell down the mountain sides and were ground into dust. Time elapsed, and by now the earth covered part of the world, because the earth itself was made by the ground up dust from the mountains. The land heaved and shook, and from certain parts there came great gouts of smoke and steam, and as I watched I saw a section of land suddenly break off from the main continental mass. It broke off, and for seconds it seemed to hang on to the main mass, in a vain hope of being reunited. I could see animals slithering down the sloping banks and falling into the steaming water. Then the broken piece cracked more. It broke off completely and disappeared beneath the waves. Somehow I found that I could see the other side of the world at the same time, and I saw to my unutterable amazement land rising out of the sea. It rose up like a giant hand rising it. It rose up, shook a bit, and then quivered to a standstill. This land, of course, was just rock, not a plant, not a blade of grass, and nothing like trees. And then, as I watched, a mountain nearby burst into flames, lurid flames, red, yellow, and blue. And then there came a flow of lava, white-hot, flowing like a stream of hot water. But as soon as it touched the water, it gelled and solidified, and soon the surface of the bare rock was covered by a rapidly cooling mass of the yellow-blue. I looked up in wonder, and I wondered where my guide had gone. He was there just behind me, and he said, Very interesting, Lobsang, very interesting, eh? We want to see a lot more, so we will skip the bit where the barren earth shook and writhed under the cooling by space. When we return, we shall see the first types of vegetation. I sat back in my chair, and I was absolutely amazed. Was this really happening? I seemed to be a god looking down at the birth of the world. I felt peculiar, because this world in front of me seemed larger than the world I knew, and I... Well, I seemed to be possessed of remarkable powers of vision. I could see the flames eating out the centre of the world so that it would be a hollow world, something like a ball, and all the time as I watched there fell upon the surface of the earth meteorites, cosmic dust, and strange, strange things. Before me, quite within my touch, I thought, there fell some machine. I could not believe this at all, because the machine was ripped open and bodies fell out, bodies and machinery, and I thought to myself, in some future age someone might come across this wreckage and wonder what caused it, wonder what it was. My guide spoke. Yes, Lobsang, that's already been done. In this present age coal miners have come across truly remarkable things, artefacts of a skill unknown on this earth, and then also there has come to light in coal some very strange instruments, and in one case the complete skeleton of a very tall, very big man. You, Lobsang, and I are the only ones to see this, because before the machine was quite completed, the gods known as the gardeners of the world 
had quarrelled over women, and so we can only see the formation of this our earth. If the machine had been completed, we would have been able to see on other worlds as well. Wouldn't that have been a marvellous thing? The meteorites rained down, raising splashes of water when they touched that liquid and causing bad indentation when they hit rock or the rudimentary soil which at that time covered the earth. The llama moved his hand to another button, switches, I suppose they were really called, and the action speeded up so fast that I could not see what it was, and then it slowed down again. I saw a lush surface on the world. There were vast ferns larger than trees towering up towards the sky, the sky now covered with purple cloud, and causing the air itself to be of a purple hue. It was fascinating at first to see a creature breathing in and then exhaling what looked like purple smoke, but I soon got tired of that, or soon got accustomed to it, and I looked further. There were ghastly monsters, incredible things, which trod their stolid way through marshlands and bog. It seemed as if nothing could stop them. One vast creature, I haven't the vaguest idea what it was called, came across a whole group of slightly smaller creatures. They would not move, and the larger one would not stop, so he just lowered his head, and with a massive spike of bone on what I suppose was his nose, he just ripped his way through the other animals. The damp soil was strewn with blood, intestines, and other things of a like nature, and as these parts of the animals fell to the ground, there emerged from the water peculiar things with six legs and jaws shaped like two shovels. These things tucked in to all the food they found, and then looked about them for more. Yes, there was one of their members who had fallen over a log or something and broken a leg. The others all set upon him and ate him alive, leaving only the bones to bear evidence of what had happened. But soon the bones were covered with foliage which had grown, flourished and withered, and fallen to the ground. Millions of years later this would be a coal seam, and the bones of the animal would be dug up and be a seven-day wonder. The world spun on faster now because things were developing more quickly. The Lama Mingyar Dondup stretched out to another switch, and with his left elbow he jabbed me in the ribs and said, Lobsang, Lobsang, are you sure you're not asleep? This you must see. Now stay awake and watch. He switched on whatever it was. It might be called a picture, but it was three-dimensional. One could get behind it without any apparent effort. The Lama dug me in the ribs and pointed up at the purple sky. There, there was a gleam of silver, a long silver tube, closed at both ends, was slowly descending. At last it was clear of the purple clouds, and it hovered many feet above the land, and then, as though it had come to a sudden great decision, it dropped gently to the surface of the world. For a few minutes it just stayed there, motionless. One had the impression of some wary animal looking about before leaving the safety of its covering. At last the creature seemed to be satisfied, and a great section of metal fell from the side and hit the ground with a soggy clang. A number of peculiar creatures appeared in the opening and looked about them. They were about twice the height of a tall man, and twice as broad, but they seemed to be covered in some sort of garment which covered them from head to foot. The head part was quite transparent. We could see the stern autocratic faces of the people inside. They seemed to be poring over a map and making notations as they did so. At last they decided that everything was all right, and so one by one they dropped on to the big piece of metal which had fallen to the ground, but which yet remained attached to the vessel by one side. These men were covered in some sort of sheath or protective clothing. One of the men, I guessed that they were men, although it was hard to say through all the smoke and the difficulty of seeing past their transparent headpieces, but one of them stepped off the big sheet of metal and fell flat on his face in the murk. Almost before he had touched the surface, vile-looking creatures dashed out of the vegetation and attacked him. His comrades lost no time in producing some sort of a weapon from the belt they wore. 
Quickly the man was pulled back onto the sheet of metal, and it was seen that the covering of the body was badly torn, apparently by animals, and red blood was flowing. Two of the men carried him aboard the ship, or whatever it was, and several minutes later they came out again, carrying something in their hands. They stood on the metal sheet, and both pushed a button on an instrument that they were carrying, and flame came out from a pointed nozzle. All the insect things on the sheet curled up into a burnt crisp, and were swept off the metal sheet, which then closed up into the body of the ship. The men with the flames moved cautiously around, playing the flames on the floor or on the ground, and burning quite a swathe of earth on one side of the ship. Then they switched off their flames and hurried after the other men who had gone through a forest of ferns. These ferns were as big as big trees, and it was easy to follow the passage of men through them, because apparently they had some sort of cutting device which just swung from side to side and cut the fern down almost a ground level. I decided I must try to see what it was they were doing. I moved from my seat and went a little way left. There I got a better viewpoint, because now I could see the men apparently coming toward me. In front of the other men, two men held some machine which glided along and cut down all the fern that got in the way. It seemed to have a rotating blade, and soon they broke through the forest fern and found an open space in which a number of animals were gathered. The animals looked at the men, and the men looked at the animals. One man thought he would test their aggressiveness, so he pointed a metal tube at them and pulled on a little spur of metal. There was a tremendous explosion, and the animal at which the weapon had been pointed just fell to pieces, just collapsed. It reminded me of a monk who had fallen from the top of a mountain, Everything was so scattered. But of the other animals there was no sign. They took off too quickly. "'We'd better move on a bit, Lobsang. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and we will speed up for about a thousand years.' The Lama moved one of those switch knobs, and everything in the globe swirled around like a whirlpool, and eventually it came to its natural rate of rotation. This is a more suitable time, Lobsang. You'd better observe carefully, because we will see how these caves were made. We looked very carefully, and we saw a very low ridge of hills, and as they revolved closer to us, we saw that it was rock, rock covered in green, mossy material, except for the very top, and that top just showed bare rock. Off to one side we saw some strange houses. They seemed to be half round. If you cut a ball in half and you put the half that had been cut on the ground, then you would have some idea of what these buildings were like. We looked at them and saw people moving about. They were clad in some material which clung to their bodies and left no doubt as to which sex was which. But now they had the transparent headpiece off and they were talking to each other, and there seemed to be quite a lot of quarrelling going on. One of the men was apparently the chief. He brusquely gave some orders, and a machine came out of one of the shelter places and moved towards the rocky ridge. One of the men moved forward and sat on a metal seat at the back of the machine. Then the machine moved forward, emitting something from nozzles all along the front, the forward part, the bottom, and the sides, and as the machine moved slowly forward, the rock melted and seemed to shrink inside itself. The machine emitted ample light, so we could see it was boring a tunnel right into the living rock. It moved on and on, and then it started to circle, and in the space, for a few hours, it had excavated the big cave into which we first entered. It was an immense cave, and we could see that it was really a hutment or a hangarage for some of their machines which were flying about all the time. It all seemed most puzzling to us. We forgot all about time. We forgot all about being hungry or thirsty, and then, when the great chamber was finished, the machine followed a path which had apparently been marked on the floor, and that path was converted into one of the corridors. It went on and on and on, out of our sight. But then other machines came in, and in the corridors they excavated rooms of different sizes. They seemed to melt the rock. It seemed to just melt, and then push its way back 
leaving a surface as smooth as glass. There was no dust and no dirt, just this gleaming surface. As the machines did their work, gangs of men and women moved into the rooms, carrying boxes and boxes and more boxes, but the boxes all seemed to float in the air. Certainly they were no effort to lift, but an overseer stood in the centre of a room and pointed to where each box should be deposited. Then when the room had its full complement of the boxes, the workers started unpacking some of them. There were strange machines and all manner of curious objects, one I recognised as being a microscope. I had seen a very crude one before, because at one time the Dalai Lama had been given one from Germany, and so I knew the principle of the thing. We were attracted by a brawl which seemed to be taking place. It was as if some of the men and women were opposed to the other men and women. There was much shouting, much gesticulation, and at last a whole collection of men and women got into some of these vehicles which travelled through the air. They said no goodbyes or anything like that. They just got inside and the door was closed, and the machines went up into the air. A few days later, the days according to the speed of the globe we were watching, a number of the ships came back, and they hovered above the encampment. Then the bottom of the ships opened, and things fell out. We looked, and we could see people running with desperate speed away from where the things would fall. Then they threw themselves flat on the ground, as the first object hit the ground and exploded in a violent, brilliant flash of purple. We had difficulty in seeing, because we were absolutely dazzled by the brilliant flash, but then from the forest of ferns there came thin shafts of brilliant light. They moved about, and one of the shafts struck one of the machines in the air. Immediately it vanished in a burst of flame. You see, Lobsang, even the gardeners of the earth had their problems. Their problems were sex. There were too many men and too few women and when men have been away from women for a long time, well, they get lustful, and they resort to great violence. There is no point in us watching this, because it is just a case of murder and rape. After a time a lot of the ships departed, apparently to their mother ship, which was circling the globe far out in space. After some days a number of big ships came and landed, and heavily armoured men came out and they started hunting their fellows through the foliage. Whoever they saw, they shot without asking any questions. Shot, that is, if the person was male. If she was female, they captured her and carried her off to one of the ships. We had to stop. The pangs of hunger and thirst were pressing too much, so we had our ordinary tamper and water, and having got through that and done a few other things, we returned to the chamber which had the globe, which appeared to be the world. The Lama Mingya donned up, switched on something, and we saw the world again. There were creatures on it now, creatures about four feet tall and very, very bandy. They had weapons of a sort, consisting of a piece of stick, at one end of which was lashed a sharp stone which they made sharper by chipping away and chipping away until there was a really sharp edge. There were a number of the men making these weapons, and others were making weapons of a different kind. They seemed to have a strip of leather, and in it they placed large stones. Two men drew back the leather loop, which was saturated in water to make it stretchable, and they together released the loop. A stone would go soaring away toward the enemy. But we were more interested in seeing how civilizations changed, so the Lama Mingyar donned up worked his controls again, and everything became obscure in the globe. It seemed to be several minutes before there was a gradual lightening, as of the dawn slowly appearing, and then there was normal daylight again, and we saw a mighty city, with tall spires and minarets. From tower to tower there stretched flimsy-looking bridges. It was a marvel to me that they could support themselves, let alone take traffic but then I saw that all the traffic was aerial traffic. Of course, a few people walked about on the bridges and on the different levels of street, but then all of a sudden we heard a thunderous roar. It did not dawn on us for a moment that it came from the three-dimensional globe, but we looked intently and we could see minute specks coming towards the city. Just before reaching the city, the minute specks circled and dropped things from their undersides. The mighty city collapsed, 
the towers were shorn off, the bridges crumpled like pieces of string too knotted and twisted to be of any use. We saw bodies falling out of the higher buildings. We guessed they must have been the leading citizens because of their dress and because of the quality of the furnishings which fell with them. We looked on dumbly. We saw another lot of little dark dots coming from the other direction, and they engaged the invading dots with unparalleled ferocity. They seemed to have no regard at all for their own life. They would shoot things at the enemy, and if that failed to bring them down, then the defenders would dive direct on to these. Well, I can only call them big bombers. The day ended, and night fell upon the scene. The night lightened by mighty flares as the city burned. Flames were breaking out everywhere. From the other side of the globe we could see cities there in flames, and when the light of an early dawn shone upon the scene, with the blood-red sun following on, we saw just heaps of wreckage, just piles of dust, and distorted metalwork. The Lama Mingyal donned up, said, Let us skip a bit. We don't want to see all this, Lobsang, because you, my poor friend, will be seeing this in actual life, before your span on this world is terminated. The globe that was the world spun on, darkness to light, light to darkness. I, I forgot how many times the globe spun, or perhaps I never did know, but at last the Lama put out his hand, and the swirling globe slowed to its normal rate. We looked carefully this way and that way, and then we saw men with bits of wood in the shape of a plough. Horses were dragging the ploughs through the ground, and we saw building after building just topple, topple into the trench dug by the plough. For day after day they went on with their ploughing, until there was no sign that there had ever been a civilization in this area. The Lama Mingyar Dondup said, I think that is enough for today, Lobsang. Our eyes will be too tired to do anything tomorrow, and we want to watch this, because this is going to happen time after time, until, in the end, battling warriors will almost exterminate all life on the world, so let us just get some food and retire for the night. I looked up in surprise. Night, master, I said, but how do we know what time it is? The lama pointed to a little square, a fair way off the ground, perhaps as tall as three men standing on each other's shoulders. There was a hand there, a pointer, and on what appeared to be a tiled background there were certain divisions of light and darkness, and the hand now was pointing between the lightest light and the darkest dark. There you are, Lobsang, said the Lama. A new day has almost started. Still, we have plenty of time to rest. I am going to stand in the fountain of youth again, because my legs are hurting quite a bit. I think I must have scraped the bone very badly, as well as lacerating the flesh. Master, master, I said, let me attend to it for you. I sped into the room of the fountain, and hoisted up my robes. Then the water started to come, and I moved the little thing which the Lama had called a tap. I moved it so that the water kept on flowing after I got out and I turned on another tap thing, which I had been told admitted a lot of medicated paste into the water, where it rapidly dissolved and swirled around with the water. The Lama sat on the edge of the pool, and then swung his legs over and into the water. Ah, he said, that feels better. This brings great relief, Lobsang. Soon my legs will be quite normal again, and this will be just something to talk over with wonder. I rubbed his legs briskly, and little bits of scar tissue came off, until at last there was no scar tissue left, and his legs, again, looked normal. "'That looks better, sir,' I said. "'Do you think you have had enough for now?' "'Yes, I'm sure I have. We don't want to keep at it half the night, do we? We will make that do for now, and go in search of food.' So saying, he climbed out of the pool, and I turned the big wheel thing which let all the water flow away somewhere. I watched until the basin was quite empty, and then I turned on the tap full just to flush away bits of scar tissue. With that gone, I turned the taps off again, and went in search of the Lama. "'We've done enough for today, Lobsang,' said my guide. "'I vote that we have samper and water for our supper, and then we go to sleep. We will eat better in the morning.' So we sat down on the floor, in the usual lotus position, and we opened out and we spooned out the samper. 
Now we felt ultra sophisticated. We were not taking our samper scooped up by our fingers. We were using a civilized implement, which, by the illustration in one of the books, was called a spoon. But before I could finish my supper, I fell over backwards, dead to the world again, sound asleep, and the world rolled on and on.